1862, Nebraska Tenant Forage Powell's gave up. Comically exhausted, he turned his back on the farm to seek his future in town. This is a scene played out to its sad climax 170,000 times in this country last year. As older farmers retired or died, as tenants were displaced by machines, or as young farmers simply gave up. Most of these 170,000 times, departure from the land contained the bitter admission of failure and a host of shattered dreams of sparkling green fields, of a comfortable farmhouse, a magnificent barn. Most of these times, it meant that a dream of plenty had been routed out by the reality of want. This is Reed Point, Montana, where my parents now live. Its population totals 65. I first saw this town in 1923, when it had a population of about 400. The town's boom period began in 1913. It prospered until the late 20s, when highways and the Depression spelled disaster. It sent its sons to war in the 40s and declined throughout the 50s. As farmers leave the land, the little towns suffer contract and even disappear. Weed-choked empty lots are the cemeteries of prosperous yesterdays, and even the grave markers, the old foundations and basements, are filled in and overgrown. Fifty years ago, more than half our people lived on the farm. Today, only one in eight remains. We have become a nation of city dwellers, but we are reluctant to acknowledge it. There is something about country lanes and burgeoning fields and the scent of new hay and bucolic 160 acres which are a part of our folklore. By this dearly held mythology, we are blinded to a vast agrarian upheaval, as common to the South, the East, or the Midwest, as it is to this little Montana town. This is Lexington, Georgia. In the decade from 1950 to 1960, its population dwindled from 514 to 376, while our national population increased by 28 million people. In 1950, Grayford, Texas, had a population of 655. Ten years later, it was down to 448. In the same span, the population of Texas mushroomed 24%. In California, the town of Nyland was cut down before it incorporated. It shrank in 10 years from 700 people to about 200, while the state's population exploded 48%. Farmington, Washington had 341 people 10 years ago. Now it has 176. These towns have this in common with thousands of others. They are small, they are agricultural, and they are dying. This is Dunlap, Kansas, not as it is today, but as it was around 1915 when the population was 650 and growing, the main street lined with buggies. Today, the main street of Dunlap lies virtually deserted. The empty buildings stand there, dried up relics of a past that slipped away so recently and so unobtrusively we can scarcely believe it's gone. Dunlap is an agricultural ghost town. There are hundreds like it across the country. 
Here, they built a city hall of stone for a future that never materialized. It was cut short, first by the automobile that carried farmers past Dunlap to bigger stores in larger towns, then by a gradual consolidation of farms that drained away the surrounding population. The city hall, robbed of its purpose, fell into disrepair and then into ruin. In 1916, a six-year-old boy posed with his sisters for a picture in front of their Dunlap home. Today, the house is empty, but Fred Bernard, in middle age, remembers the neighborhood as it was. The heyday of this street and this, these houses was probably 40, 50 years ago, back about 1910, 1920. Uh, these houses were built before then by people who lived here to work in the various stores and industries in town and uh, were later taken over by retiring farmers as they moved to town after making their fortune, which they most always did. Now, most of the houses in Dunlap are empty. Dunlap probably started to going downhill as much as 40 years ago. But not noticeably, we always thought it was just a little slump, you know, in those days, wouldn't face the facts. And of course, in the Depression days of the dirty 30s, why, all the uh, young folks that weren't well established all came back to mom and dad's table. All the stores were lit up on a Saturday night and the streets were all filled with cars, children running around, playing hide and seek and so forth. But that didn't last long because it, young folks soon got out from underneath the dad's table again and back on their feet. Since then, it has been rather rapid. At one time, there were two banks in Dunlop. Now, there are none. The Guarantee State Bank lasted until 1959, when it paid off its depositors and locked its doors, leaving behind a tableau of its final day. Banker Charlie Hauke, who started out here in 1918, said, if I made a mistake, it was settling in too small a town. Farming today is big business. The small country bank, with its limited reserves, has been crowded out. is gone, so are a dozen other businesses. All that remain are a feed store, a post office, and a filling station on the edge of town. Of the 134 people who remain in Dunlap, most are waiting out the inflexible arithmetic of mortality and watching grass grow in the gutter of the city hall. to the decline of a small agricultural community is the decline, and perhaps approaching extinction, of the small farmer. We have cherished him since the days of Lexington and Concord, 
as a national symbol of our virtue and our strength. Virtuous he still may be, but strong he is not. In terms of coal statistics, the lower 53% of our farms account for only 8% of our total farm production. These farms, the small marginal farms, could disappear overnight without affecting our surpluses or the price of our groceries. The problem of the small farmer is not that of a production line in trouble, but of a human being in distress. This is a small farm near Bouchong, Kansas. The crop is grain sorghum, a livestock feed many farmers call Milo. The farm is run by Robert Whitaker and his wife, Velma. We have a 160-acre farm. Uh, our principal crops are alfalfa, corn, milo, wheat, and sometimes we grow some oats. Uh, we grow about uh, 20 acres of alfalfa, about uh, 10 acres of wheat, about uh, 10 acres of corn, about 25 of milo. The Whitakers don't own a truck. They can't afford one. They bring Milo from the field in a small trailer hooked to a car. The car belongs to Robert's father. The father, 80-year-old Andrew Whitaker, is bothered by arthritis, but he helps with the harvest whenever he can. When the Milo is ripe, everyone drops what he's doing to help bring it in. Our budget is quite limited on the farm. I try to do my part by saving. I uh, can every year. On the average, I can about 150 quarts of fruit and around 70 to 80 quarts of vegetables and somewhere around 50 pints of jams, jellies, and pickles. I help with bringing in the grain when harvest starts. And in the fall, I... Uh, I uh, help bring in the Milo, help auger it off of the trailer, which we use to haul it in with, and help auger it back into the bin. The family car, a 1948 model, also carries feed for the family's 50 cattle. Our main source of income comes from the sale of livestock. We have a little from the sale of grain. Uh, we net about $1,700 a year. I think uh, perhaps one year we made $2,200. Uh, it's been a few years back. And I think perhaps well, that was one of our better years. The Whitakers net $1,700 a year out of sales that gross about $3,700. Yet even with a taxable income of only $1,700, the Whitakers are no worse off than 60% of the farmers in the country today. On their $1,700, they must raise three children and help take care of Robert's aged parents. They do it, for the most part, by doing without. This is Rodney Whitaker, 12 years old. He wants to follow in his father's footsteps. His chance of succeeding on this farm is almost non-existent. We do not have the latest equipment. Uh, it, uh, some of it's just rather old. In fact, we have one old tractor my dad bought in 1928, and we still use it a little. We have uh, another tractor that's about 12 years old that we do most of our farm work with, and uh, so our equipment isn't of the latest nor the best. Over and over, in all possible variations, three basic factors lie at the root of the trouble for these 53% of our farmers who produce only 8% of the food and fiber. One, they are on marginal or worn out land. Two, they have been unable to grasp or afford the new farm technology. Three, falling farm prices. Low farm prices have seriously threatened even the ideal farmer on good land. For the less than ideal farmer on less than ideal land, 
low prices have meant disaster. Robert Whittaker scrimps, patches, does without. With luck, he may hold on. Sold out, sixteen dollars. Okay. We, we got some, we got uh, some buildings out here. Yeah, we got these posts here and some buildings. All right, we'll sell a lift. Sell this here. In the Great Plains, March 1st is the customary date for new landlords and tenants to take over. So beginning in January, the crisp air rings to the cry of the auctioneer, while the neighbors gather as much to visit as to bid. This is the auction, 20 miles south of Lincoln, Nebraska, of a man who gave up trying to make a living on 320 acres. Sixteen dollars, sixteen one hit again. Sixteen dollars, sixteen one hit again. Sixteen dollars, sixteen dollars, go sixteen dollars, go sixteen. Now put sixteen one hit again. Sixteen dollars, one go sixteen. Fall through, all done. Sold out, fifteen dollars. All right. You want to hit it again, sir? Four tens, go ten. I'm bid four five, go ten. Four ten, four ten. Where's my man? Go over there. There he goes. Four five, and now ten. Go ten. The farm machinery on sale here belongs to Lambert Termat, a tenant farmer. Fly you all through at four five, and would you go ten? Four, five, and out, ten, go ten. Termot lived here 15 years. Last March, a steel company in Lincoln taught him how to weld and gave him a job. Now he's leaving the farm to become a full-time welder. My wife, I probably shouldn't say this, but my wife cultivated uh, most of my mile on corn this year. You know, I was working in Lincoln, and uh, it's really the handiest little tractor drives like a car. In other words, it really gets out there and does the job. I pulled that 15-foot disc with it out there. And it's really a snappy little thing. And I'm bid three, five. Would you go ten? Would you go ten? A uh, four, four, five, and would you go ten? Four, ten. Four, ten? Yeah. I'm bid ten now, fifteen. Would you go to fifteen? Would you go to fifteen? Four, ten now, fifteen. Would you go to fifteen? Four, ten now, fifteen. Would you go to fifteen? Hit him again to fifteen. Four, ten now, fifteen. Would you go to fifteen? Four, ten now, fifteen. Would you go to fifteen? Would you go to fifteen? Would you go to fifteen? Say fifteen. Here, fifteen. Would you go fifteen? Fifteen, we go fifteen now, twenty, we go twenty, four twenty, we go twenty. Hit him again, four twenty, we go twenty at four twenty, we go twenty, we go twenty, four fifteen now, twenty. Four fifteen and now twenty, we go twenty, we hit it twenty, we say twenty, we say twenty. Four twenty, four twenty, play all through. Four twenty, sold out, four fifteen. These auctioneers have held sixty-seven farm sales in the past two years. Of the sixty-seven who sold out, 32 moved to town. A farm sale is one of those emotionally charged dividing lines separating us from our past. But change is not necessarily tragic. Lambert Termat may make more money in town. Yet there remains the nostalgia of remembered voices echoing across vacant yards and empty rooms. Each year, up to a million people leave the land and migrate to the city. 20 million since 1940, almost half the farm population. The houses and barns rot in the sun, but the land remains green, tilled by someone else. In the Dust Bowl days of the 30s, farmers fled because the land produced too little. Now they are forced out because it produces too much and drives crop prices down.
Not very many years ago, in my lifetime, this county had 15,000 population. Now then, it's down to 12,000. That's 3,000 people, 3,000 people less. That's just as if the earth had opened up and swallowed a town of 3,000. And in this part of the country, a town of 3,000 would be a pretty big town. That was a weekly paper in Westmoreland, Kansas. The town started as a watering stop on the Oregon Trail. It grew into a farming community of 500 people. In the past 10 years, the average farm in this county grew from 300 to 390 acres, while the number of farms dropped from 1,600 to 1,200. But Westmoreland remained relatively stable. There are several reasons for a town existing. It can be an industrial center, it can be a shipping center, it can be a dominant trade center, or as in the case of Westmoreland, it can be a county seat. Now, when you're a county seat, that means a lot of things, particularly in this part of the country. It means here that we have the courthouse and we have the courthouse payroll. We have the county shops and their its payroll. And we have the other government offices that uh, go with being a county seat. Then uh, when people come to these offices, when they come to the courthouse, when they come to the ASC office to see about their business, uh, they go into the grocery store, they buy a few groceries, they stop in at the hardware store and get some nails. Uh, if it wasn't for being a county seat, Westmoreland just wouldn't be here at all. Westmoreland has survived because it's the county seat of Pottawatomie County. But the people who live here are worried. To attract new residents, they have applied for urban renewal. They have no sewers, their gutters and sidewalks are falling apart. But small town appeals for urban renewal get a mixed reception. Many sociologists feel small towns have outlived their function, that rescue should be directed toward larger rural units. Dwight Nesmith, an expert in rural area development at Kansas State University. There are 530 small towns in Kansas, towns with less than 2,500 population. Now, if we assume that we're going to save all of these little towns, as some people apparently want us to try to do, let's take a look at the arithmetic that we get involved in. These towns now have a total population of about 300,000 people, an average population of 570 people. This means that we would have to add 2,120,000 people to Kansas, essentially double the population of the state of Kansas in order to bring them up to the minimum of 4,000 population apiece, a minimum which I feel is realistic if these towns are going to provide the goods and services that people have a right to expect from their community. We can't do this based on, based on agricultural jobs. These are declining all the time, so we're going to have to depend on industrial development. Now, one manufacturing job will support a population of about three people, so that means we need 703,000 new manufacturing jobs in the state of Kansas, or an increase of about six times as many as we have at the present time. Now, another way to look at this, we're going to put all our industrial development efforts in Kansas for a year into saving these small towns, it turns out that the 100 plants with an average of 23 employees and an assumed uh, mortality rate of about 50% would be just about enough to save one city. And therefore, in 530 years, the job would be done. It's all very well, and it's probably logical for these sociologists to say, well, let's, let's uh, consolidate these towns. Let's, there's no more need for these small towns. Let's pick up the people, move them to a larger town. But that just doesn't take in the human factor. People are living in Westmoreland because they want to live in Westmoreland. Uh, here, we don't have everything, the things that that we need, we don't, for here, for example, we don't have a sewer system. There's other small towns around us that don't have a water system. But there's other things, maybe, that are needed, and it's hard to put into words uh, what they are, but people are living in these small towns because they want to live there. When they're gone, there'll be other people who will prefer to live in those towns, in these small towns. Uh, all, all we want, for Westmoreland is to make it a nice place to live. Westmoreland, Kansas, and Reed Point, Montana, and all the thousands of other towns like them were once nice places to live. Some still are for the very few who can find a way to manage it. 
What we have just seen is an example of the national social problem which happens to reside on the land. It is made up of the 53% of the American farmers who produce only 8% of the crop of food and fiber. They represent a social problem for various combinations of two basic causes. One, they're on land which should never have been tilled in the first place. Or two, they've been too slow in becoming the expert agricultural economist technician, which characterizes the successful farmer. Nowhere else have science and technology been so intensively and extensively understood and applied as on the American farm. The successful American farmer is one of the supreme technical experts of all time. But even he is in trouble and is going under because of his technical skill in making things grow. Even he is driving himself or being driven off the farm because he's producing too much, running too fast to stand still. In 1970, the average American farmer produced enough to feed five people. In 1940, he fed 11. By 1960, the number of people fed by each farmer had jumped to 26. In 1960, we produced 1 billion 300 million bushels of wheat, 4 billion 300 million bushels of corn, 14 million bales of cotton. Production on the American farm has tripled since 1940. But the very productivity of this most efficient farming system in the world has left us floundering like the sorcerer's apprentice in a flood of plenty. The man who has suffered most from the overproduction of the farm is the farmer. Forty-seven percent of our farms account for ninety-two percent of our farm production. These farms are large, mechanized, and efficient. Despite their growth, the vast majority remain family farms. This is one of them: the one thousand-acre farm of Lloyd Sellers in Rice County, Kansas. Sellers, with only one hired man, farms seven times as much land as his grandfather did under the Homestead Act, and in the winter feeds three hundred cattle. Twenty years, Rice County has lost about forty farms a year. Most of those that go under are small. They are taken over by farmers like Lloyd Sellers. And the acres that we now have in this farmstead that we farm, there used to be three other farmsteads. And、uh, over the years, they have all been torn off. I, I helped tear down the buildings on two farmsteads. And my father tore down the buildings on one before I can remember. On one corner of our home place, there used to be a, a one-room schoolhouse. In fact, us kids went to the room, that one-room schoolhouse. But as the schools got bigger and consolidated and merged, then this school ceased to be used as a school. So we got one acre more under the plow than it used to be. Farmers like Lloyd Sellers make the most of each acre, despite government programs to control production. A farmer out on this land has to try to make a living. So when his、uh, allotment is cut down to where he can put, can is not allowed to produce as many acres, then he tries、uh, everything he can think of 
to increase the production mm -hmm. on the acres he is allowed to farm so that he can still make a living. So he'll farm better, he'll summer fallow more, the summer fallow will really increase production. And then he will uh, probably use more fertilizer, buy more com commercial fertilizer, which will help keep the production up. In other words, keep about as many bushels as he was raising anyway. Farmers do not boost production to be contrary. They feel they are driven to it by chronically low prices. There is little profit on one bushel of wheat or milo, so they try to grow enough to profit from sheer volume. This is in direct competition with government efforts to raise prices by reducing acreage. Because farmers can grow more on each acre, attempts to limit production this way have failed. Now the government would like to control instead the bushels a farmer can market. But what farmers fear is a disastrous time lag between lower production and the day of higher prices. This big plow is one reason Lloyd Sellers and his hired man can farm a thousand acres. The successful farm today is a big business in acres, in machinery, and investment. Contrary to a carefully nurtured stereotype, it usually is not a bottomless reservoir of Cadillacs. A five-bottom plow costs $1,000. The tractor that pulls it costs $7,000. Sellers owns three tractors, three trucks, and a pickup, a $9,000 combine, and much more. His investment in equipment is at least $40,000. This winter, he is feeding cattle that cost $20,000. The land is worth at least $150,000. Yet, over the past three years, his net income has averaged only $7,500 a year. He lives comfortably, but he is not rich. This kind of farming foreshadows the future, and the ranks of economically qualified applicants are thinning out with uh, the cost of machinery and equipment as it is today, if a young boy wanted to start in the farming business and didn't have a father or some relative or somebody that would go with him and give him uh, some land to start on and help, help him get started with equipment and stock, it would be almost impossible for him to start. The most important single factor in the immense productivity of the American farm is the Land Grant College, a unique American institution. This is Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas. It was founded just 100 years ago. ROTC training written into the Land Grant law is still a required course at Kansas State. But what was a college is now a university, complete with a cyclotron under construction. A few hundred yards from the cyclotron is an experimental plot of hybrid milo. Out of fields like this came the basis for our agricultural revolution. A current project is hybrid wheat. Tentative results in the form of a few precious kernels have already been passed around to interested researchers. 25 grains of wheat went to the University of Nebraska. At the University of Nebraska, some research on hybrid wheat was already underway. Interest there quickened when the top expert at Kansas State was hired away by a commercial seed company. Space agencies are not the only victims of industry's technological piracy. A hybrid plant is a cross between two varieties. They are cross-bred to encourage the best qualities of both. Hybrid corn, which boosted production 25%, was the accidental result of basic genetic research. Plant research consumes time. It can be accelerated by what are called growth chambers. A growing day under artificial sunlight is 18 hours, set on a timer. Here, scientists can grow four crops of spring wheat a year. It took farmers 20 years to realize the production advantages of hybrid corn. 
Now, most of our corn is hybrid. Hybrid Milo, which you saw harvested on both the Whitaker and Sellers farms, was not introduced until 1957. Now, just four crops later, it comprises 95% of the Milo planted. Hybrid wheat, if it works, will catch on even faster. At the present time, scientists can make hybrid wheat, but it will not reproduce itself. They are looking for some freak variety of grain that will lend itself to the development of reproduction. And they're certain it exists somewhere. Of course, hybrid wheat may be too expensive. It may not increase production. It may not have the adaptability researchers foresee. But on the other hand, it may. These few plants could foreshadow the bread of the next generation. There is at Hutchison, Kansas, a grain elevator that stretches across the plain for half a mile. Each year, we produce enough wheat surplus to fill it four times over. Year by year, the unused surplus mounts, piling up storage charges. Surplus, the tarnished side of our agricultural miracle, is not a new problem. Since 1930, in every year, we did not have a severe drought, a war, or a major war relief program. We have had surpluses. In no one year do they amount to more than 5% of any one crop. Yet added up, the cost of coping with them is two and a half billion dollars a year, an annual charge about the same as the total spent on development of the atomic bomb under the Manhattan Project. The farmer is the target of constant exhortation, not all of it unselfish. Ambitious politicians, editors with axes to grind, urge the farmer one day to spurn the federal farm programs and be a free farmer. The next day, they scream at him to protest, to rise up, march on Washington about this or that phase of the federal program. He is pushed and pulled, admonished and harangued into schizophrenia, offered the best of two incompatible worlds, the no red tape, no document, no affidavit kind of free economy agriculture on the one hand, and the highest price supports guaranteed market maximum benefit kind of no risk agriculture on the other. Surpluses are even stored in military bases left over from World War II. They depress farm prices. They cost tax dollars. Perhaps worst of all, they represent the waste of unused food in a world where half the human race is undernourished. This is Lyons, Kansas, county seat of Rice County. Lyons is one of those farming communities which has prospered in these years of sweeping agricultural change. It has a population of 4,000. It is the kind of town where people go when they bypass the Dunlaps and the Westmorelands. Arnold Fankhauser, who runs a clothing store, knows why. Really, we have about seven or eight towns that uh, used to be competition here, in a sense, and sold the same items that we, in turn, sold here. While this town was a little larger, uh, those towns uh, actually did quite a bit of business. And uh, I don't mean to disgrade them. They were more or less uh, pickle barrel type stores. Uh, and uh, they couldn't do any better because of their size. But actually, Lyons, Kansas was a little larger. And uh, I would say that the pattern has changed uh, in this way. Uh, they like to shop in a little better town. Lyons has better stores, more of them, and good roads leading in from the four points of the compass. Also, it has been the county seat since 1876. Farmers in the aggregate are good consumers. Because of all their equipment, they use more petroleum than any other industry in the country and comprise one of the biggest consumers of steel and rubber. This is reflected in the economy of Lyons. Lyons has four grocery stores, two of them supermarkets. The car just pulling into the curb is driven by a farmer's wife. 
She drove 10 miles, bypassing two smaller towns closer to home, to shop here. Since fewer farmers grow a little of everything, their wives buy more food in the store, including meat, milk, and eggs. This farm wife's habits are changing, and so are those of the store. Supermarkets have begun to compete with drugstores as purveyors of everything under the sun. Since these items go in the grocery bill, we tend to think of them as part of the cost of food. Often they are not. Since 1949, food has risen less than most other items on the cost of living index. And the farmer's share from the cost of food has gone down 12%. We asked the shopper who had come 10 miles to let us read her grocery list. We found out two things. She spent more money than she meant to, and 35% of what she spent was on non-farm products. Aluminum foil, which costs 35 cents, is a non-farm product. About one-fourth of the price of ice cream goes back to the farmer. He gets three and a half cents from a 25-cent loaf of bread. The farmer gets back about half the money we spend for bacon. About 82 cents on a steak costing $1.41. The return on butter is high, 56 cents for a 79 cent pound of butter. Soap powder is a non-farm product. So are all the paper tissues we buy and most of the plastics. Canned corn costs 45 cents. The farmer gets back a nickel. Grocery stores now sell ping pong balls. No sale for the farmer. The most expensive item of all, the impulse purchase of a long playing record. Corny, perhaps, but not from the farm. Overall, packaging and middleman costs are up. The farmer's share has gone down. That is Lyons, Kansas, a beneficiary of the agricultural revolution. Yet, even here, there is a shadow. Well, of course, the opportunity for the young people here is not nearly as great as it used to be because you know, our farm population, you see, is decreasing quite rapidly. The larger farmer is taking over what used to be two or three or four farmers. And uh, the children that are uh, coming raised on the farm, uh, they don't have an opportunity to go back on the farm. And uh, in order to keep those people here at home, we must have industry here to, to attract them if we're wanting to keep up the population. Or they don't have any other choice after they get out of school but to go to some factory or get a job elsewhere in some other part of the state or some other part of the nation. One Lyon student who will return is Stephen Sellers. You met his father. Stephen, with a degree from Kansas State University, is coming back to farm. He wants most a farmer's independence. I'll be my own boss. I can do anything I want to do, whenever I want to do it, however I want to do it. I have no restrictions. I can uh, cover the whole half section with feedlots if I want to, or irrigate, or raise swine, anything I want to do. It's going to take a lot of planning and technology to make it go at farming nowadays. If I were going to be an average farmer, I don't think I'd go back, because actually the average farmer has a rough road to hoe. But I believe with my training, and uh, hard work, I believe I can make a go of it. And that's what I love to do, so that's what I'm going to do. Stephen Sellers will return to his father's farm. In this, he is more fortunate than most. The farm, by present standards, is large. The investment in expensive equipment has already been made. Yet a generation ago, this farm was sufficient to earn a man a good living. Now, 160 acres will not bring Robert Whitaker enough income to justify the expense of efficient farming, which is the only kind with a chance of survival. Stephen Sellers will raise his children in this community. Now, Lyons is prosperous. It has taken over from the smaller villages that compass it. But Dunlap, too, was once prosperous. Stores stayed open until 1 o'clock on Saturday night until the gasoline engine was harnessed to four wheels. 
Stephen Sellers is a college man. His chance of succeeding appears as good as that of any young farmer. But the very college which educated him has unleashed the knowledge of which surpluses are made. And these surpluses may loom darkly across most of his adult life. Change is the constant and the pace is accelerating. All the Stephen Sellers, the new generation of farmers, must live with it. The alternative is this. If I'm bid eight ninety would go nine hundred dollars, go nine now, put them nine, are you all through? All through, all done. All through. Hit him again, would go nine. Would you go nine? Would you go nine? Last call, would you go nine? Wanna hit him once more? One more. Sold out, eight ninety. We city people are selfishly maintaining a vast underappreciation of this fellow on the land. These 47% of our farmers who are providing us with the greatest cornucopia of plenty at the lowest prices in all history. We have him providing for us now at an average rate of 80 cents an hour for his dawn to dusk effort. It is not just charity or generosity or fairness which suggests that we might do better for him or by him but plain economic self-interest and common sense. A banker has said that there is still enough national investment in the land that a depression could start there again. 80 cents an hour for a farmer's labor would appear to be flirting with it. In addition to the investment, we have observed that the farmer is the supreme consumer of everything we city people produce. He not only consumes in prodigious quantities the groceries, clothing, and gadgets which the rest of us produce, but on top of that, he is the buyer of farm machinery, fencing materials, lumber, paint, tools, and chemicals. If he goes under, so do machinery companies, steel mills, truck manufacturers, and chemical plants. And so do we. Before the turn of the century, American labor began solving its economic problem by collective bargaining. Collective marketing is a way out for the farmer. It has worked in the production of milk, fruits, and a few other commodities but it hasn't yet been applied to grains and other farm produce because it's complex and unwieldy and because the farmer himself is a rugged individualist, a stubborn, contrary, suspicious, and untrusting nonconformist. The only instrumentality thus far devised by the minds of men to represent the farmer, act as his counsel and agent, urge him to collective programs or production control or act as his own policeman, is the United States Department of Agriculture. The farmer frequently assails it, we taxpayers don't like it, and the government itself would love nothing more than to hear the last of all such expedient measures as soil banks, price supports, and surpluses. But thus far, the farmer has been unable to bring himself to the final step, rationalization and firm control of his own production. Nor have we city people been of much help to him. We now control more power and influence in the Congress. A program which will save the farmer will probably originate there. When and if it does, we might bear in mind that he has been a pretty good provider for us. And we might understand that we're all in this together. If he is not prosperous, we're not going to be either for very long.